Let's go back to 2010. March Madness. A Cinderella story. Destined to meet Goliath. And when the dust settled and the game was decided, it was a clash of two distinct styles that gave us one of the most memorable final shots of all time. A shot that had the entire stadium wetting their pants, but for completely and diametrically opposed reasons. Brad Stevens was in his third year at Butler and had led his team to an improbable appearance in the final game. Coach Krzyzewski was in his 10th Final Four and had already won three titles. Suiting up would be a few names we'll still recognize to this day. Kyle Singler played in the NBA for the Pistons and Thunder, but couldn't come anywhere close to the accolades he enjoyed in college as one of the premier players in the country. Gordon Hayward was a promising big guard back then, but I don't think anyone would have predicted he'd be an NBA All-Star and average 20 points a game. We had two Plumlee brothers, but they hardly played at all, while Shelvin Mack was a primary ball handler and scorer for the Bulldogs. And the difference between these two teams offensively was enormous. Butler employed a four-out, one-in system, running very modern actions like this slip ball screen into a dive to the hoop that got them a layup and a shooting foul. Because Duke was still utilizing the hedge of the pick and roll, look how out of position it gets Miles Plumley, and his brother doesn't help until it's too late. Another well-designed set by Stevens as they set a back screen for the guard before reversing it to the top, then the left wing. Watch Hayward shuffle cut to the strong side while they run Han off the pin down. Shire can't keep up and it's a wide open triple. Rather than hearing only my insights into this game, I was lucky enough to have a player who was actually on the court join me to discuss several key plays. Shelvin Mack was a 19 year old sophomore on this team and went on to play eight years in the NBA and is now in Israel playing for Hapol. Shelvin Mack, thank you so much for joining us. I can't tell you how much uh, I appreciate this all the way from Israel. Oh, yeah. No, no thanks for having me. Um, I think everyone needs some basketball. You know, the time is going on in the world right now. So you know, I love to sit, spend some time, break down the game with you. Yeah, I appreciate it. And everyone's uh, no, no, no problems there where you are? Uh, no, nah, not so far. Uh, I think they're doing a great job of keeping it contained. You know, everyone's just kind of on um, lockdown right now. So I'm spending a, you know, a few extra days in the house with the family. You know, spending some time with you, re-watching some games that I played in. Uh, you no, know, just taking advantage of it. Great. Well, let's talk about one of the games you played in. Can you believe it's been 10 years since you played Duke in the finals of the 2010 March Madness tournament? Uh, no, it's very, it's very crazy. Uh, no been 10 years since we played. Uh, you know, a lot of me and my teammates actually kind of never talk about the game. So it was very interesting you know, to watch the game with you. I think it's going to be my first time actually watching the game instead of talking about it uh, in 10 years. You know, once we lost, we kind of just moved on from there. Uh, didn't want to talk about it. It's like a big cloud, a big elephant in the room. So I'm anxious to see what, what we see from it. So let's just break right into it because early in the first half, you guys run a sideline out of bounds play. And I take it that this is probably a play you've probably run a thousand times in the season to generate great shots. Can you walk us through how this worked and why you got open for this three? Yeah, it's a, it's a play that we run a lot. I don't want to give you the name of it, but uh, <laughs> you basically have, you know, Gordon, you basically have Gordon Hayward um, coming on a diagonal cut to the block. You know, he draws so much attention being 6'8". And a guy and a player that he is that you know a lot of people will help and try to bump and, and look for him. And then at the same time, um, you know how me coming off a pin down with uh, Willie Beasley and Matt Howard setting setting the, the stagger. So with Gordon cutting through, it, it automatically makes my dude kind of has to jump to the ball and tag and help a little bit. Then it gives me separation to come off the come off the pin down. So okay, now Duke decided to switch this. So now you have Singler on you instead with a step. Um, you take a dribble, uh, you put, try and put your defender in jail, which is not even a term I don't know if we even had back then, but you try and get him on your back. Um, you know, then you kind of do a step back three from, I don't know, four feet behind that line. Uh, how common was that for you that year to shoot those kind of threes? Um, it was very common for me. Uh, you know, Coach Stevens gave me a lot of freedom. So it was important for me to be very aggressive, you know, at all times and, you know, and every moment. Uh, you no, know, throughout the season we just got comfortable. You know how it goes. Uh, you no, know, you make a few of them, 
you get a little bit of a longer leash, you're able to do it more freely and uh, over time. And I think that's kind of what happened throughout my time at Butler. Because I, I never started off shooting a lot of threes, uh, you no know, off the dribble, you no know, usually just catch and shoot, shoot shots. Sure. I mean, listen, 2010 was a long time ago now where, you know, Steph Curry wasn't even doing what he was doing now. People weren't even conceiving of shooting off the dribble threes, which then brings us to our next clip, because in transition, you know, a 19 year old sophomore in the NCAA finals uh, and you are just blown up from three on the break again. Are, were you in practice at Butler, you know, practicing these kind of shots? Uh, yeah, we kind of do like um it's like a vitamin workout, you know, individual with your coach every single day. Mm -hmm. So we kind of do that. And also kind of with the game plan and what I got used to doing is a lot of times I could just kind of lure you to sleep and just shoot it before you're able to, to switch or do anything else. And it caught a lot of people off guard. You know, I noticed you use the hop on that shot. And uh, I'm a big hop guy. We talk a lot about how the, the rhythm and the speed are, you know, maybe more beneficial in a one-two. Did you feel like, you know, on this one too, did you feel like that gave you, gave you an extra advantage off the dribble? Uh, yeah, it, it, it makes it quicker. It's a, a, like a quick pop to give you, you know, some energy, some uh, some extra lift in your shot. But like on that clip, you know, I was kind of just sitting there waiting for Matt Howard to come and it kind of relaxes Nolan Smith. You know, as he was picking me up, he was very aggressive. Then me sitting there waiting for the pick, it made the shot easier for me. Meanwhile, Duke was firmly playing 1990s basketball with pin downs on either side of the floor and an overabundance of cutters that just served to clog the lane. With all the bodies in and around the basket, it made it easy for Butler to help out on any Duke advantage, as Hayward was only one step away to thwart this layup, and because three players gravitated towards the lane in the shot, Butler can race back down to get an easy bucket in transition until Shire's incredible hustle broke up the play. Duke continually defaulted to this same set, and what you end up getting is six to eight bodies inside the lane and pressured shots like this floater by Shire. Brad Stevens understood even back then that the best way to generate good shots was the use of ball screens, and Ronald Norad gets two in a row out top, and once Zubek high hedges, it forces Lance Thomas to cover the roll man. Nolan Smith spins underneath the second ball screen, there is no help, and Norad gets the layup. Yet another possession of two big setting screens near the blocks. The lane completely clogged, preventing drives and leaving Singler to have to hit a contested no-rhythm three ball from four feet behind the line. Duke ran a version of movers and blockers, where two players were solely responsible for setting screens and ducking in down low, while players like Singler would come off those screens looking to shoot. Under pressure, he executes a gather step into a 1-2 that was deemed perfectly legal back then and got him enough distance from the defender to get a layup out of it. But it was Butler who consistently displayed better offensive action all night long, as they set a pin down for the center, who then goes to ball screen. This is designed to get the defensive center trailing the play before hedging and getting even more out of position. Watch Hayward diagonal cut all the way across the floor off of two pin downs. He's wide open with a great shot, but can't hit. And we got a brief head-to-head -head matchup between Singler and Hayward in transition, and Gordon bumps him easily out of the way on the spin and hits the little four-footer. This looks like modern NBA offense as Juke sets a quick drag screen for Mack. Watch how hedging gets Zubek so far behind the play that Jukes can flare to the open spot behind the line and have lots of time to let this shot fly. You gotta give credit to Coach K for being so consistent on offense, I guess, as they run yet another floppy on either side. Look how there are eight people in the lane on this curl, forcing Shire into a tough contested semi fall away that he actually banks in by accident. There were a number of times where Butler was able to attack on the catch to collapse the defense and generate open shots. When Zubek gets overzealous in his help and the easy pass to Jukes finds him with a catch and shoot from distance while Duke struggled to get open looks because everything was so deliberate. Thomas only has one look, Singler ducking in, and misses the open cut because of it. Now, Zubek's only choice is to get the ball to Shire. Had he wanted to turn the corner, since his man was two steps behind him, he couldn't because of all the congestion down low in the paint. When Smith curls around the pin down, it's easy for Hayward to challenge a shot since he didn't have to go far at all. The number of easy shots Duke got in this game were few and far between. But this set was nice, where they show a back screen for Singler, he opts to use the cross screen instead and gets a running start. 
His defender foolishly goes underneath the screen, and that's all the room he needs. Meanwhile, Butler continued to run great offensive sets, like this Matt Howard inside ball screen that gets him great low post position as they crack back to the weak side wing. Lance Thomas has no hope against this perfect bounce pass, and Butler ties it up. One of the deciding factors of this game was Matt Howard's foul trouble, which plagued him all tournament long. And after Duke was forced into another very tough shot, Howard got whistled for this. It forced him to the bench early with his third foul, but Butler again utilized the hedging in the ball screen to get an opening for Norad, who waltzes right to the rim for another layup. Again, the key for the offense is that they only have one player near the basket. Jukes holds off the help in an attempt at posting up, kinda, and Mack runs Smith into his teammate as he lays it up easy. No, the only way this play will work is having you no know, very unselfish bigs. It's hard to get big to, you know, to duck in, nor they not getting the ball. Like, uh, so in that clip, every Jukes kind of know he's not getting the ball, but he's ducking in, acting like he is. And, uh, no, it's a lot of great players at that high level. All you have to, you can beat your man, and most people can't, but you have a layup. They bring Howard back, but he loses his balance on this post move, and out of frustration, wax Plumley for his fourth foul, forcing him to the bench yet again. But the Bulldogs wouldn't give up, and notice how, again, without a center and the offense properly spaced, there's room to drive. Forcing Shire to help on the penetration, Lance Thomas isn't prepared to rotate out to the corner, and Norad has all the time in the world to let this one fly and get Butler the lead again. What got Duke the advantage in this game was their size and physicality. Check how Singler is able to shove his defender out of the way before popping out behind the three-point line for a quick release over the challenge and right into the hoop. And this baseline out of bounds play was very well designed. As Zubek sets a routine pin down for Singler, both Singler's man and Zubek's man jump to Singler, leaving Zubek wide open for the easy layup and a four-point lead. And Singler was at it again as Hayward blows right by him out top. Notice the forearm to the back that pushes Hayward into Shire. Then notice that Shire was not close to being in legal guarding position either. Yet it's a turnover and an offensive foul on Hayward. Maximizing out-of-bounds plays is crucial in games like this, and Duke does it again by catching Van Zandt unaware of the ball as Singler gets the little lob to go into the basket easy. You can either give credit to the Duke defense for consistently sticking to the high hedge principle of defending the pick and roll, or you can wonder why they didn't adjust this. As Matt Howard slips the screen, leaving his man completely out of position as they backscreen the help on the block and get a nice lob to him under the hoop and generate free throws. After two free throws for Duke on a relatively weak call on Norad, watch Mack set the back screen for Hayward, drawing both defenders to the cutter. Mack attacks on the catch, gets right to the basket again, but great play by Singler to block this cleanly and help retain possession. Up three and going into crunch time, Duke again runs the same play. Pin downs on both sides of the floor. Needless to say, it didn't get them anywhere, and then watch how one player tries to set an inside ball screen at the same time Singler is trying to post up on the same side. They force him down to the baseline, and when Singler tries to make a hammer pass to the corner, it's easily stolen. Then watch Hayward streak up the court for a layup before getting violently yanked down to the ground. This would have been a flagrant foul in today's game. Heck, it probably should have been a flagrant back then too, but instead, he simply got his two free throws. Up one at crunch time, Duke finally runs something different. Well, it's the same play but on only one side of the floor as Singler comes back around a second time and hits the quick release 15 footer. Inside of two minutes and Butler is down five and looking to get aggressive. Good block on the awkward shot by Norad as he twisted through the lane, but check how the handoff forces the switch of the much smaller Shire onto Hayward. He gets right into the lane, forcing the help to step up, and the nice dump-off pass cuts the lead to three. Looking for a good shot, Duke runs the loop for Nolan Smith, sprinting around three straight screens for him. By the way, it's never a good idea to set a screen in the lane because of the three seconds rule, and if you're wondering, Shire first steps into the key at 125 and is still in the key at 120. But maybe the basketball gods intervened when the refs blew this one because there was no other way to explain how Smith misses this wide open layup. Butler wisely pushes the ball up fast to generate a wide open three that would have given them the lead. But a transition three is a good shot because it gives you a better than average chance at rebounding the miss. What I like about this is that as the play developed, you go back to uh, a double ball screen, which you'd run several times in this game. 
And let me ask you this, when you were preparing for this game in the days leading up to the game, uh, did you guys kind of get excited knowing how Duke was going to guard the pick and roll that you would be able to generate so many great shots? Uh, yeah, you know, so Coach Stevens does a great job of you know, watching team, breaking down film, and calling plays to put you in the right position to be successful. So let's walk through what happened here because a double ball screen and what we'd seen all game long is how they would hedge high. And not to, I don't want to criticize Coach K too much because every team did this. But uh, every time that you guys lured the big out like four or five feet above the three-point line, it seemed like every time you were just completely ready for that and to be able to crack back and hit something for an easy layup or an easy shot. So what are you seeing here that opened up? Zubek, who's hedging, uh, he doesn't really want to switch you know, uh, with, with me having a ball and him guarding Matt. So as you can tell from the clip, I'm just drilling. I'm not really being aggressive with my dribble. I just kind of know like he has to head. So kind of playing the game with him, like uh, make, making the right read. See Singler cheating out going toward Willie, and, and then uh, Thomas is face guarding Matt, I mean, uh, face guarding Hayward, so at least Matt wide open underneath the basket. It makes the play so so simple. I mean, what it ends up generating is a two-on-one with Singler having to guard two guys. He makes the mistake of, you know, thinking that you're going to go to the uh, to the to the wing instead of the, the basket, leaving the basket area open. But it just seems to me, you know, Coach Stevens would have been just salivating every time knowing that they're going to just, A, bring the big up, and then the guard. I think Nolan Smith needed to switch, and instead he goes to the ball too. Can you hear me shaking my head? Up one, Duke again goes to a floppy set. And it gets sloppy when Shire runs into Singler down low, but it works when the defenders run into each other as well. Singler is open for several steps through the lane, finally gets it wide open, but almost airballs it from 13 feet. Yikes. Eventually, this comes down to an inbounds along the baseline with under 14 seconds left. They curl Beasley around the screen, and Hayward misses him open for a step that would have been a layup for the lead, and they have to call timeout. They decide to put Hayward out top to receive the ball, and this time, Butler's spacing got a little screwy, with Howard taking up space and Beasley cutting through. Hayward gives it a shot with a fadeaway, but can't hit it, and that sets up the thrilling finale. After hitting the first free throw to go up two with 3.6 seconds left, Coach K decides to get smart and tell him to miss the second one on purpose. With no timeouts left, he's thinking the clock will just run out before they can get a shot at the basket. But this kind of strategy is normally reserved for when there's way less time on the clock especially because Hayward gets the easy rebound, check the crushing screen set by Howard to free him up, and missing that free throw on purpose is the only way Duke can lose this game. I wonder if Coach K soiled his pants a little as this ball kept carrying closer to the basket, closer, closer, and even though it hits the backboard first, it still almost goes in. And that's how Duke survived against the mid-major with a fraction of the resources that they have. One bounced differently somewhere, and we might have had one of the best stories of the decade, as I feel Duke didn't really play well enough to win, but outlasted them with a few beneficial calls and some extra physicality. I played in the NBA for eight years. I don't think I've ever played in a game of that magnitude, especially you know, in front of 80,000 fans, you know, five, ma five miles away from Butler's campus. Uh, it was just a overall great experience and time that, that me and my teammates had. But I can't remember a certain play besides Gordon missing the half court shot that like sticks out in my mind. Like sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. Ah, well let's you know talk about that for one second. Like what that play unfolded, and by the way, there's an interesting notion there because there was 3.6 seconds left on the clock when uh, they did they did the intentional miss, which I kind of think is a little too much time on the clock to do that. Uh, thoughts on that one? Um, yeah, I, I think in college it's, it's not, it's kind of, it can go either way because you can't advance the ball. So I can, I can, it's not many games that kind of been in that situation and you know, over time, 2010, you kind of see it all the time now. So you're able to have better data and see it. Uh, I think we drew up a great play and had a, uh, you know, a great look. I always joke, you know, Gordon made that. No, we'll have a movie out right now. <laughs> well, you know, at, give me some insight into what was going through your mind. Like you mentioned, you remember that, you know, that he, Gordon's drilling the ball to the right side, and you realize he's going to have a nice kind of a look. Uh, Howard sets a devastating screen on his man. Uh, you know, what what do you remember at that time when there's the ball is on the way to the basket? Uh, yeah, no, obviously I was probably cutting trying to get the ball. Uh, right. That didn't happen. I'm not like a half-court guy. 
Um, but I know Matt is going to be at half court coming down, setting the screen for either me or Gordon wherever he gets the ball. Uh, no, it freed him up. The basketball was in the air for like a, a long time in my head, and you no, know, just hit, just hit the corner corner of the back rim, and that that was it. Now I was very proud of myself, my teammates. Uh, you no, know, it wasn't nothing that we felt sad about. Like we could have feel like we honestly feel like we did everything we could. It just didn't go our way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Going through this game now, uh, you know, ten years later, it was clear to me that uh, you guys, you guys played. You did what you did needed to do, and uh, you know, maybe a couple of Matt Howard calls that were on him that got him out of the game early. Uh, really, really, I thought hurt. And uh, did you feel like the Duke physicality had any effect on you guys? They were bigger. Uh, you know, we caught a couple of uh, plays where they, you know, there was an offensive foul on Gordon Hayward on a push on the back, uh, and then Shire wasn't anywhere near set. But, like, weird calls like that. Like, it just seemed like, you know, it literally it was like one of those calls and maybe one of the Matt Howard calls, and that would have been it. Uh, yeah, but I would say, you know, um, that year, we was, the, we was a pretty physical team. Um, in our freshman year, we went through a lot, won 20 games, and you know what elevate us is me, me and Gordon going to USA, the U19. So we was able to pick up the physicality of of the big schools and all of that. So I think we was pretty pretty prepared and for that. But um, no, the style of play. Sometimes the calls goes with us. Sometimes the call doesn't go. But uh, no, the biggest thing Coach Stevens always say is give ourselves a chance, and that's why like, I feel none of us is kind of sad. We gave ourselves a chance, and like I said, it just didn't happen. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing these thoughts and bringing them down the game with us. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, looking forward to seeing what's going on with you over in Israel on the court. And uh, uh, stay safe out there, Kelvin, please. Yeah, there, nah, no problem. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, no, I'd love to do it again. Watch some video. Uh, I'll have a blast chopping stuff down, breaking stuff down and, and watching. You got it. And don't forget, sports fans, that B-Ball Breakdown, not a channel, we're a conversation. You win. Are you in, Kelvin? I'm in. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to B-Ball Breakdown so you can get alerted right away when we drop a new video. This season will be filled with incredible content, so don't miss it. You in?